And we couldn't think of a better way to start the festival off with Zena Arafat and her new book because it achieves exactly all those things. Uh, queer Palestinian voices are not only subjected to the silencing from anti-Palestinian actors, but also from those within our own community. And her story is the portrait of a woman, you know, finding her voice and establishing her, her identity in different worlds that she belongs to. This book has topped many must-see read lists and all those um, accolades are included on our event page. And we are extremely thrilled to, be to have joining her for the discussion portion of the event our, you know, the acclaimed Palestinian-American uh, poet, George Abraham. There is a place on our platform uh, for you to be able to write all your questions down, tell us your comments, feelings, and definitely tell us where you're watching from and you know, share some love for Zaina and George. And we'll, look, we'll collect those uh, questions, those audience questions for later in the uh, discussion. I also wanna thank um, Anju uh, Goja from the Another Story Bookshop, our partners in this event. This event would not have happened without her and her hard work. So please, if you want to purchase Zaina's book or all your books, make sure you do it from this amazing bookstore that has helped us uh, for many years planning these wonderful author events. TPFF also has some goodies lined up for you to make festival watching from home even more fun. We have a comfy line of loungewear designed in collaboration with Toronto's Peace Collective, uh, which you can purchase at shoptpff.ca. And we have curated all your meals for you this week with our Sahtain at Home partnership with Yummy Local Arab Restaurants. So please be sure to get comfortable and order some yummy meals from our partners. Today's film, a lot of today's films and arts are already online. So be sure to check out Samar Hajazi's art exhibit and our two incredible short collections, which are already available and will be available for the entire week of the festival. And please be sure to uh, check out the Canadian premiere of Najwa Najjar's film um, from our website, and that will launch at 7 p.m. after this event. Please let us know what you, you are thinking, uh, what your feelings are about the films, the works, the festivals, by tag and your favorite moments by tagging us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook using the hashtag TPFF2020. I'm sure our artists would love to hear directly from you and hear your thoughts about um, the wonderful works that they have presented. Uh, TPFF is a completely volunteer run nonprofit organization. So we have to take a moment to thank our incredible sponsors, including the Ontario and Toronto Arts Councils and our amazing gold sponsors, Paramount Lebanese Kitchen, Medical Aid for Palestine and Police uh, Peace Collective. And we ha also have to thank the many, 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 many of you who heeded our calls for help um, and donated money to make sure the festival could continue this year. Uh, we could not have done it without you and your support. So thank you so, so much. And thank you for sharing the festival with all your networks too. So we are so excited to begin this event with Zena, um, Zena and George. Uh, their extensive bios are on our website, so I won't uh, go into them um, in detail, but I will, you know, I'm excited as you are to jump right into it. So I'm going to throw it over to George and have him take it away. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, this is all really exciting. Um, I'm really excited to be here um, with Zaina and talking about You Exist Too Much, which is one of my favorite novels of the year for sure. Um, and Zaina is an artist I've known for a few years through Rawi, the Radius of Arab American Writers. And I'm just so, so honored and excited uh, to be here with you. So, what are, so Zaina, tell us a little bit about your book maybe to open us off, just um, giving a brief overview in case uh, viewers might not be familiar or have read it yet. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, by the way, I'm just so happy to be here. Um, thank you to Toronto Palestine Film Festival for hosting us and George. I'm so excited for this conversation. So um, I think it's easier if I talk about the sort of origin story of the novel that rather than trying to, to describe what it's about, as most artists know, it's really hard to do that, um, to capture, you know, what is it about? 
<laughs> hardest question. So, I mean, so this book, oh, and I should say, I, I sometimes close my eyes when I talk, so don't be, don't be frightened. Um, this book began with a question around unattainability. Um, and I was, you know, thinking about, uh, I created a character who sets her sights mm -hmm. on unattainable women. Um, and that was the sort of like macro struggle for, or my, sorry, the micro struggle for this character was this like um, quest for love that was very sort of frustrated because of the fact that the object of her affection was unattainable in some way or another. Um, and then from there, I started thinking about unattainability on a sort of collective cultural level, on a like national level, on a political level. And she herself is a Palestinian, a Palestinian American. And so unattainability, you know, began to trickle into my mind in the form of like Palestinian statehood for one thing. Of course, that's, as we all know, um, a largely unattainable thing and something that Palestinians have um, sought for, you know, <laughs> we're nearing, I guess, 75 years. Um, and so then additionally, thinking about unattainability in terms of home and mm. being kind of culturally in between, um, and not being able to attain like a sense of full belonging or full um, home, I suppose, to one culture or the other and kind of being in between. And so like those are the levels on which the book operates um, and they all sort of circle around this theme of unattainability and structurally it's, it's unique. But um, if there's a narrative arc of some sort, it's basically following her as she like... Um, tries to break this pattern of um, setting of unattainable and sort of destructive, often mm -hmm. one-sided relationships. Um, the central relationship being with her Palestinian mother. <laughs> mm -hmm. So there's that intergenerational dynamic to the book as well. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the, the, um, so did you want to maybe go ahead and read from your first passage in the book, perhaps? Actually, yes. Why don't I read from that? Um, yeah. Oh, and unattainability in terms of acceptance as well, because she is um, sure. queer. So yeah, I'll read from the first, the opening passage of the book, which I think maybe captures, better says what I'm trying to say now. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so this is the first page, and I'll just read the first couple pages. <clears throat> In Bethlehem when I was 12, men in airy white gowns sat at a three-legged table outside the Church of the Nativity. They ran prayer beads through their fingers and sipped mint tea in gold-rimmed cups shaped like hourglasses, steam floating off the surface and up into the bright blue sky. I walked past them with my mother and my uncle as we wandered through the holy city. One of the men called out, Haram, forbidden, for the especially devout among us, it is haram for a pubescent girl to expose her legs in a biblical city. It occurred to me then that I wasn't a flat-chested kid anymore, that curves had begun to appear along the length of me. I was no longer indistinguishable from a boy child. What should we do? I asked my mother. I felt a pulsing lump take shape in my throat. My great-grandparents' house was where we were staying and where all of my clothes were, 36 miles and three checkpoints away. I should have had more sense than to dress in such a way when we were visiting the birthplace of a prophet, albeit not our own. My mother had, and still has, a native's knowledge. She knows the rules instinctively in that part of the world, and I only ever learn them by accident. Basita, said my uncle, it's okay. My mother looked me up and down. We approached the main door of the church, and the men hissed again. My uncle ran the tips of his fingers across his mustache, then looked to my mother and me. Come, he said. I have an idea. We followed him into a gift shop just off Manger Square. He dropped a few coins on the counter, then asked the shopkeeper if we could use his bathroom. My uncle's master plan was that he would trade me his trousers for my Roxy surfer shorts. He went into the bathroom first, and I could hear the sounds of fumbling, his belt jangling as it hit the floor. He opened the door slightly and handed his pants to my mother so she could administer the swap. She then stood in front of me while I took off my shorts. Yella, she said, her most frequently used word. Hurry. I pulled on the pair of pants. They sagged on me. I had to tighten the belt all the way up to the last hole and then roll the waist so that they wouldn't fall off 
leaving me even more exposed than I had been before. I stepped out of the bathroom and looked at my uncle. I examined my new curves against his ridiculously pasty legs, gangly and covered in sporadic patches of hair, my shorts tight against his thighs. It occurred to me in that moment to question why, as a man, his bare legs were somehow less troubling than mine. It was a double standard, a shame I had simply accepted until then. In acquiring my gender, I had become offensive. But as I stood in front of him, an unexpected pride began to swell inside me. I liked the way his trousers made me feel. Like I could get attention from boys, from girls. I felt, for once, seen. In Tiwalad with Labinit, are you a boy or a girl? A security guard at the Intercontinental Hotel in Amman had once asked my cousin Noor this question when deciding whether to lead her into the curtain-shrouded women's check for an intimate pat-down before she could enter the lobby. Binit, Noor had responded. Girl. She'd been insulted by the question, the uncertainty it revealed. But not me, not that day. Wearing my uncle's baggy trousers, I enjoyed occupying blurred lines. Ambiguity was an unsettling yet exhilarating space. I'll stop there for that one. Amazing, amazing. It was great <laughs> hearing that. Oh, thank um, you. <laughs> yeah, out loud. And um, also seeing, because I have the galley, I have the advanced copy. So it's also interesting seeing what changed and what. Oh, like, yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it was kind of funny seeing the blueprints and then, like, <laughs> then the house. Oh, uh, yeah. Because one of the passages I actually highlighted to talk about was actually completely like taken oh, out. I was like, oh no, my tell God, me. Like, yeah. the, um, there's a beautiful, because I, I don't want to like, I, I guess, expose. Like, it's okay, it, it, because actually, okay. I it's probably in here. I just edited it out when I was reading sometimes because wow. I feel like I want to get to the, you know. <laughs> okay, okay. The um, That part about, um, I felt myself go cold. I had ruined everything. I closed my eyes and prepared to receive her reaction. I knew better than to try and preempt it with an apology. All I could do was strategically try to calm myself. I knew that the anticipation was heavier than the thing itself. I thought that the emotions and the anxiety that going into that moment in the speaker was so, like, palpable and, I guess, like, relatable for me for, like, different family interactions um, with, like, um, Palestinianness and... Um, in kind of was really important for setting different, I guess, foundational um, concepts that like this uh, narrator is going to grapple with throughout the novel. Um, yeah, I think that I, it's funny that because I was sitting there like deciding whether to include that passage. I like cut some stuff out beforehand, uh, and that anxiety that she feels um, and worry about the mother responding to her mistake of wearing shorts, right? and not having any way around it because the house being, you know, three checkpoints away. I think that anxiety is a huge part of her struggle is like, and part of that, you know, acceptance that she's seeking and um, the sort of barriers to entry that exist for her. They come from like culturally, they also come from like the family level as well. And especially mm. from the mother who, um, you know, she's sort of terrified of and the mother is sort of a larger than life foreboding figure throughout the novel right yeah could we like maybe talk about that a bit because mm -hmm. again i thought that this um i thought that this beginning uh was really great at setting up um how the novel treats intersections of so many different topics like motherhood uh yeah. queerness uh homeland and um mm -hmm. mental health and how all these things are kind of in a nice um, existing harmoniously within each other and also at odds with each mm -hmm. other. Uh, can we talk a little bit about that and how that's like, kind of shaped throughout the novel? Um, yeah, I mean, so, yeah, exactly. Like, motherhood, queerness, homeland. I mean, like, truthfully, these were... I wanted the character to be messy in terms of her, like, identity markers, but also in mm -hmm. terms of, like, her sort of struggles in the same way that, like, any person is, you know, has overlapping... Um, qualities and also like hard to reconcile like struggles and tensions in their life and I think so that's the pur the purpose of that opening scene really is to like take all of those things and somehow weave them together um, mm. and to really like 
set the stage uh, to sort of show, I think what the stakes are and what she's up against, which is precisely that. It's this like, um, it's this seeking approval from the mother, first of all. There's the um, feeling kept out of the homeland and sort of foreign to the, you know, rules of it and customs and just, you know, culture. And also the 10, the, I mean, I'm tr I tried to sort of plant the seeds of like a budding realization on her part of um, queerness. And in fact, like the passage mm -hmm. does continue with the mother sort of recognizing in her daughter something different and mm -hmm. unsettling um, when she sees the daughter's satisfaction at wearing the pants versus, you know, wearing the baggy pants. So like, I think mm -hmm. that... Um, it's a it's like a simultaneously unique set of struggles and yet so ununique because at least that's what I've found since the book came out is so many people coming forward saying things like, Oh my god, I totally relate to this character and I'm like, mm. Wow, I'm surprised. Uh, I'm <laughs> but I mean like I do think like sexual like one's sexual identity, one's cultural identity, one's like family identity, these things are really they start to like I don't know. They can, I think when there's like, gosh, I want to say when there's like ten, digression in one area of one's life or just like tension, it can sort of bleed into other areas of one's life, um, mm, interestingly right. enough. And so, so yeah, I'm, I wonder if that's what's happening with this character, but, um, but anyway. I, I love that. Honestly, I love that word messy, like to describe, because mm. I think that like, I don't know, there's like, of, of course there are a lot of like, pejorative connotations to that word and there are a lot of ways that that word can especially like that recent new york times thing calling don mi Choi's book like quote unquote mess um mm -hmm. when it's like no she's like no this is actually just anti-imperialism <laughs> like totally. the new, york, new york times like get it right <laughs> um but yeah. like, i actually love that word mm -hmm. here and like mess is kind of like um because this character does have to unpack a lot mm -hmm. as the book goes on. This character does have to confront like difficult intersections, intersections that sometimes are trivialized, I think, in a lot of um, representations of Palestine. And on the flip side, like non-Palestinian representations of queerness as well. Um, right. And yeah, and, and, and so that just kind of gets me thinking a little bit about, um, also Carmen Maria Machado's uh, recent book, uh, In the Dream House, talking about oh, yeah. queer villainy and how mm -hmm. we need to like stop inspect expecting all queer characters in these books to be like morally pure or morally superior beings or whatnot. So it's like really great actually I, um, to see like this kind of like deeply human, um, deeply mm -hmm. flawed, character uh in this way um and, and not even flawed i guess just just a character oh. that has so many different um levels of like mess going on and i really appreciated well, that representation i'm so glad you said that and yeah she certainly is flawed i mean like she um wait I, you had like you said like three things that i want to respond to <laughs> Sorry, um, yeah. no 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 no, no. It's, it's it's wonderful but like um her, I, I, yeah, I think that, like, the controlled, I'm, I think I was aiming for, like, depicting the controlled chaos of, like, intersectionality, mm. um, which is, like, such a 21st century reality for so many of us. Um, and, you know, of course, like, this is, I think most people I encounter embody some degree of, like, intersectionality. And so, I think it can be hard to depict that in some way, um, but I, I think I, um, that was one of my goals, was why, why it is, in fact, that she comes across, why she's so messy, exactly, mm. um, but hopefully in a, like, contained sort of, I don't know, way. Um, that, right. that's, I think that so much of the work of writing this book was, like, structuring it and, and taking those various strands and having them mm. make sense together and speak to one another and um, kind of create tension between them. But, like, uh, she is indeed a flawed character as well. And, and um, I, I think that there's a, I mean, I know that there's a reason behind her often painful and destructive and, like, hard-to-watch behavior. Um, I mean, for one thing, like, I want to try and escape that, like, oppression of having to create character or that expectation that, like, you have to create characters that are either, like, 
um, re- that have to like be representative in some way that is always positive because of the unfortunate reality of there being so few representations, mm. right? And therefore like mm. kind of flattening characters and not really like humanizing characters. So like, yeah, I mean, any person has all sorts of sides to them and can act in, you know, ways that are harmful. Um, and, you know, also the other motivation behind that was, um, was to explore how her own internalized shame and like in her case, internalized homophobia as well can manifest right. in destructive ways, which can often right. be the case for, for anybody that, um, I mean, not for anybody, but that's, I think one manifestation of internalized homophobia is that it does sometimes lead to some like destructive behavior um, as well right. as like that, shame that comes from not feeling you know accepted and like kind of having to apologize just for virtue of existing as one does so um so anyway so yeah yeah so it it makes sense to say that she's she's flawed Um, yeah and the i i think that too i I guess my my own personal critique with mm -hmm. my phrasing of flawed is um like yeah we do get to see again this character which i love go through moments that are again as readers, we're like, oh my gosh, I can't look away, but like, I, I want to look away and um, yeah, yeah, yeah. see these really tense uh, mo- moments of um, as relationships break down, as mistakes are made and remade and revisited and still remade, etc. Um, yeah. Which almost made me love it more and find it more honestly more of a like more sympathy and empathy with the <laughs> with yeah. the character um, in that. Uh, but also, like, I guess I'm I, I'm thinking a lot about um, that point you made about structure as well, mm-hmm. um, and uh, and for fo- for folks who again ha- haven't read the book yet, it's a int- it's very structurally um, super interesting in that they're sort of um, it's told through kind of I guess vignettes, like some shorter, mm-hmm. some longer. Um, that are a bit discontinuous in space and time. Like there are numbered chapters that like relatively go chronologically, but interspersed between them, there are flashbacks or flash forwards. There are um, changes in setting, changes in scenery. um, And, um, and and so I'm curious to hear about how you arrived at that structure actually um, for this novel, given this, like, talking about intersectionality and talking about... Um... Yeah, no, the structure was, like, the real... God, that was hard. Um, and <laughs> it involved a lot of, like, just taping pages to the wall and seeing what should go where. But the structure came... It really, it was nuts. I looked crazy. But, like, which I guess anyone who writes a novel is a little crazy. But um, <laughs> I... Right, or poets. So, uh, I, right, writers and artists in general. I, I arrived at this structure. Um, okay, so one thing that I was really interested in was like I, thinking about automatic memory and like you know associative mm. memory. Um, and I was and why was I interested in that? I mean, first of all, just stylistically, but second of all, as a first generation Palestinian American, which is what the character is, um, you know, there's this question of like inherited trauma. Um, and I just think of it more as like uh, trickled down trauma in some way where it's like mm. the, the trauma of the, of the parents and the grandparents, like the parents who grew up, you know, under occupation in between wars. How does that affect their offspring? Like how does that affect the way they raise their children? Right. And so mm. I think a lot of the structure came from wanting to embed some of that, um, that like, those, those seemingly minor incidents that happen in someone's childhood or an interaction with a parent that seems on the surface like just, you know, meaningless and insignificant and really showing right. how that can affect a present day person, <laughs> um, how that affects you as an adult. Um, and even just, you know, more generally, like how your childhood moments affect you as an adult. So I was taking, you know, the present day narrative and within it, just like dropping in memories or scenes that come from, you know, either the parents' experience or the narrator's childhood or like scenes in, you know, over and overseas in Palestine and Lebanon Mm -hmm. and Jordan and just like trying to see how they speak to the present. 
and I guess what's complicated can is or not complicated, but I guess what's the hard work or well, what was especially challenging about that was I wanted it to not feel heavy handed and to like have these, you know, really leading breaks that take you back into the flashback. I wanted it to be sort of seamless. And so it had to be clear to the reader why it was that the scene was being placed here, like what happened before and what's coming after this flashback that makes it make sense to be in that particular place. Um, and so, yeah, and then of course, like, you know, I guess the structure, and I wonder if this isn't intentional, but just like by virtue of myself being a first generation Palestinian American with a sort of fragmented sense of home, probably <laughs> as just thinks in fragmented ways right. um, and sort of circular as well. Well, the, uh, okay, uh, gosh, sorry yeah. about these long ass answers, but like no, the, no, other, <laughs> the other, the other, re the other thing is I do feel like it has a circular structure at times. Mm, uh, right. And I think it's because of like the, um, the behavioral patterns and the addiction component, right? So there's a addiction component and with addiction, there's, you know, you cyclical behavioral patterns where you just like keep doing the same thing over and over and over and over and you can't escape it until you finally do, you know, you hit rock bottom or you seek help somehow, or you just like finally break out of that. And so I think all of that is where the structure comes from. Right. And I, I think that as you, I think you, mm. I, I've been thinking so much about the relationship between structure of like, I guess for me, a poem, but also for, I mean, more broadly, a, a, a narrative or any kind of piece of writing as a, a vessel for what kind of memory um, that speaker is trying to reckon with or trying to even arrive at perhaps through the act of writing. Um, yeah. And so, and, and to be, as you were saying, to be like, Palestinian queer uh, in the specific intersections of mental health issues, et cetera, is yeah. to have like a certain disembodied like relationship with memory. Yeah. Um, and, mm -hmm. and I love that the book kind of embodies that in its form. Yeah. Um, disembodied relationship with memory. I like that. I can read, should I read another passage that yeah. maybe speaks to, um, I think, childhood memory and like just everything I'm saying in terms of like trickle down trauma and maybe even just like the sort of fragmentary detachment um, and yet a simultaneous attachment and detachment that one has to um, yes. I guess trauma and okay I'll do that <laughs> why I mean, don't I <laughs> I was gonna I was gonna set you up knowing okay knowing your next uh, oh my god I'm sorry I look I, I've yes, never even I don't know why I'm like I feel like I'm talking I'm just going on and on all right so um I was four when I was four years old when the first intifada began as a family we would gather around the box-shaped tv in our wood paneled basement in the dc suburbs and watch the seven o'clock news I would spread out on the floor, taking in scenes of distant carnage while laying my Barbies atop one another in unintentional 69 positions. My baby brother Karim would spring up and down in his bouncy chair. My father would pour some of the newly introduced Cool Ranch Doritos into one ceramic bowl and medium spicy Old El Paso salsa into another. He'd then empty an already cold Heineken bottle into a frosted pils Pilsner glass from the freezer. Often, I'd go searching for chocolate chip ice cream and instead find Molochia. My mother was the only one who kept her eyes glued to the television, the distance from her homeland enhancing her longing and attachment as she felt it slip away. On the television screen, scenes appeared from Nablus of coffins shrouded in Palestinian flags, young men in stonewashed jeans and bandanas peeking out from behind graffitied walls and stacks of flaming tires, throwing a seemingly endless supply of stones. Israeli soldiers in tan uniforms and laced-up combat boots pacing around checkpoints with machine guns, chewing gum, and looking both vigilant and bored. These were my first images of the conflict that shattered our homeland and scattered my family. Terms like civilian casualties and Molotov cocktails and ceasefire, later replaced by negotiations and peace talks in Camp David, resounded in the Peter Jennings voiceovers as the footage of violence played on screen. We watched at a cool remove while enjoying the comforts of our American suburb, seemingly untouched, oblivious to the underlying trauma. So, um, anyway, <laughs> there's that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that ending. <laughs> wow. 
Yeah, I guess that, I don't know, that just, uh, I, I suppose that scene for me speaks to that, you know, just the stuff that ha that you encounter and you, like, first of all, experiencing like violence at a distance through a filter like that. I think, mm. Zizek, I think Zizek uh, writes a lot about that. Not that we want to talk about Zizek here, but like, <laughs> um, at, or ever, God. Um, <laughs> but I, I don't know. I think about that a lot and how like that, um, what that does, but mm. also just like the mother's sort of connection to that and mm. the daughter sort of watching the mother watching and experiencing and sort of living the pain of that. Um, and, you know, by virtue of, her own like PTSD, I suppose. Um, gosh, it's really interesting to think of our mm. parents' generation, especially the Palestinians, and like, not like they grew up in a time or even now are like really into like mental health and like therapy. You know, like they're just not, and yet they've been through so much. And you just have to wonder, like, what does that do to them, and then what does that do to their children? Right. So, um, so anyway. Yeah, yeah. that was like a conversation <laughs> I was having with my brother too because my brother i think is the only one in my family who is like really also into mental health and being like no we need to prioritize our mental health we need to go to therapy etc even mm -hmm. though like so many people in our family have like undiagnosed medical disorders etc um that yeah. they're not getting attention for uh, but i think something about um one of the things i was really drawn to in this scene especially was um and again for folks who like haven't read the book or don't have it um, the transitions between in both in and out of this uh, vignette were so striking to me, I think, because it ends um, the scene that leads up to this for folks who don't have the book um, ends with like a, a break. It, it, this is pretty early in the book, so I guess this isn't too much of a spoiler. Um, it's like a breakup scene that the last line of the preceding chapter is good luck finding someone to love you like I did. Mm. And then it goes into the next chapter where, um, you know, this chapter ends, uh, we watched a cool remove while enjoying the comforts of our American suburb, seemingly untouched, oblivious of the underlying trauma. Chapter yeah. break. Your last stop before healing. The words were displayed in bubbly cursive letters across the ledges homepage. So, like... Yeah. I, I feel like the um, it, it was almost like poetic how how the scene transitioned both in and out of <laughs> uh, <laughs> these. Thank scenes. you for acknowledging that. Yeah, that was <laughs> those moments were were intentional, and like uh, and again, truly like lots of paper taped to the wall, and like what <laughs> what what leads best into what, and like without feeling too obvious or too forced, I suppose is the word um but yeah and it's carried in the book it's like it's less um i mean there's a lot of things that are named and that are confronted but there's also a lot of memory that is so implicit and just in the book's language in the books again structures and juxtapositions that um the book holds a lot of things um without it's almost like what is said is as important as what's unsaid almost as i read this book um, yeah there's so much that goes unsaid and I think Palestinian circles, um, but anyway, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, and families, um, and but although sometimes not, but yeah. Yeah, but and also like perhaps that even shows, I guess, the readers who the book is for in a way, um, mm -hmm. what, what gets an explanation and what doesn't, and right. um, I could, I, could you talk a little bit about that perhaps, like the... Um, your, and your, your negotiation with, like, I guess, because um, I do think this book is super, another, like, quality that I really admired is totally as, like, a, a person who doesn't speak Arabic could completely approach this book and be 100% carried through it. And um, mm -hmm. w which is something that is, you know, again, to be admired in different um yeah with different goals, I guess, and different aesthetics, perhaps. I, on the other hand, like, I know a lot of other writer friends of mine are like, oh, I purposefully don't explain or translate the Arabic and um, as, like, a mechanism of saying, no, I want the reader to be uncomfortable and no, this is not for you, um, for yeah. instance. So I was curious to, like, hear more about your decisions with uh, navigating, I guess, explanation versus, um, versus not. 
Um, yeah, I mean, it's a good question because, like, that's something that I think I hadn't really, you know, I didn't start thinking about that. Per se. I think at first I sort of left things unexplained, you know, because why would I explain them if I, um, I, I think I was just thinking in terms of, like, a Middle Eastern audience, really, or I wasn't really even thinking in terms of audience. I was just thinking in terms of, like, what did I understand and why would I, if I understand what this is, why do I need to explain it? So like, like actually there's a line about that I just read like says something about Malachia and yeah. actually I cut, I mean, there's the line in the novel afterwards, if I just penciled it out for the reading, but um, because I knew I was reading for like, you know, um, Toronto Palestine Film Festival where I assumed <laughs> the audience would know what Malachia was, but like in the book I explain what's Malachia, right? Um, and I added those, I think when I was reading the notes from like members of my workshop classes, they were like, what the hell is Malachi? <laughs> or like, or even like, <laughs> even like editors and um, agents who, who I, that, that did become a challenge was like mm. balancing in my mind and in the writing, like the various audiences, because there's, you know, I think, I mean, I honestly, like first and foremost, the audience for me that I had in mind was like Arabs, Palestinians, um, because I, I think because I just, you can't help but think about how your family is going to respond to something, how your community is going to respond to it. And that's right. been my central community. And so, but then I was, I, I don't think I, I then started to think about like, well, what about, you know, non-Arabs and non-Palestinians and trying to um, balance that because you sort of had, I, I had, I was up against I think an industry that really wanted me to write for Western audiences, right? right? And to like write for like white audiences and like sort of mainstream audiences. And I, but that would have involved a lot more, um, I think problematic uh, stereotypical like images and also just like um, narratives that I was trying to like, um, challenge rather than perpetuate like for right, example yeah. I would get feedback about like well why aren't the women you know wearing hijab why are we want more spices from the marketplace like as if we all go to like some like Aladdin style marketplace like every time we're in the, but like like the, the souk, like every day people are going to the souk and like um and so I was like okay staple a spice pack to the front of the book if you want that's fine but, <laughs> but no but I, I so oh, I guys. wasn't I didn't do, I was, I just didn't want to do that because it would have just undermined the whole project. But, but I did have to give some things like some explanations, some like, you know, another thing funny that I read two sections that do this, but like the opening section with Haram and it's like in the novel itself, you know, versus in the reading I just gave where I like penciled out things that I didn't think that Arab audiences needed to be explained but like I had to sort of explain more about what's haram and what is haram to like Muslims and mm. um and that was hard for me to do because I felt like mm. I was really I really didn't want to do that but at the same time it was mm. like well how is anyone this is page one of the book and like you're selling this book at like you know indie bookshops in Minnesota or like you can't you have to sort of give some context some mm. more context than you're willing to give all the time but in the beginning yeah so that was something i had to constantly like negotiate and navigate for sure and I, but i think that again perhaps like or for me at least like, and again this was maybe just my reading i thought that it was so utterly clear based on again the juxtapositions that this speaker the book speaker was making um the parallels in memory that um and mm -hmm. associations in memory that were perhaps not easily explained or not you know um super apparent but that is just embodied and that are just like part of palestinian queer etc insert lists of intersections experience i thought that like moments like those were when the book shined in again who it's like capital f4 not like lowercase f4 perhaps and like sure i guess if you're a rando like white person picking up this book like ooh, i want to read you know um, mm -hmm. you, you'll, you won't be lost in it, which is nice, but like, Good. I think that the book is kind of just like very much, um, on a, on a very implicit level shows itself, um, who it's for, um, Good. or at least that was my reading of it. I'm um, so happy to hear that. Right. Yeah. And also, of course, I mean, it does sort of tap into a lot of, I guess, 
sub like queer the queer community i think i think i thought about that you know as mm -hmm. i was writing and um because there's you know characters queer and there are queer characters in this novel and then and it takes on a lot of i guess struggles that queer people face and um but um but i'm glad that you said that <laughs> what you said so we have a kind of really interesting question actually from the audience that i wanted to highlight before sure. we go on um thinking about this concept of unattainability um someone is asking about um where uh like someone says i'll just read their direct quote i love how you speak about shame in the book and i wonder where do you think joy lives in this book or is that too unattainable um, no, it's funny because like there was a review of the book in NPR and it was a great, I loved the review, but the, at some point the writer had written like, this is not a happy story. And I was like, why not? Yes, it is. Like, uh, I actually, that was the first time anyone had said that to me. Um, but I think that like, sure, there's shame and that's, you know, there's, it's, I think that the joy where does joy live in the novel? Is that the question? Can you? Yeah, both. Uh, where does joy live in this book? And they actually go on to elaborate, or oh. um, slash how, uh, or even in the process for you personally, yeah. and like uh, finding. However, I guess you would want to answer it. Yeah. Okay, so I'll answer both parts of that because I kind of like both parts. But um, so joy, I think where joy lives in the book is um, in the reckon the mother daughter relationship and how so. I think there's so many ways to look at the trajectory of the book. And one of them is, a, is about coming out to the mother. That's like one, mm. this is a book about like this queer Palestinian American girl coming out to her mother. Um, and so if we're looking at it in that lens, I think um, on that side of her moving like this towards coming out, there's the mother like moving like this towards acceptance. And so I think that the moments where they like kind of meet at some point, um, where there is like acceptance and where there is like honesty here from this side and acceptance from this side or just connection. Like those are moments of joy for me. Mm. Um, even though they're not like, it's not like there's some big gay, you know, Palestinian wedding at the end, but like, <laughs> right. but like there are certainly moments that, that, that show some progress on both sides. And I think another area of joy is like the narrator is really alienated in many ways um, throughout the book. Like she's, you know, culturally in between, which, you know, as we all know, like having a foot in both worlds sometimes means like having a foot in neither world. So there's mm -hmm. that alienation. She's like internally homophobic. So she doesn't really participate in any queer culture, or queer community. She has mm -hmm. her career. She's a DJ. That's a very lonely profession. So like there are times when she finds community um, in the book and I find mm -hmm. those to be really joyful moments. Mm -hmm. I enjoy I feel joy reading or writing those moments. But for me as a writer writing the book, where does the joy come from? The joy, <laughs> good question. Uh, the joy <laughs> actually truly comes from finding out what happens next for me because like hmm. following this girl on her journey that I have no control over it feels like because she really, characters really do take on a life of their own. And anytime I was frustrated with her choices, like I would wish she would make the right choice, but I couldn't control her. So. I think times when either I would have an insight into her behavior and why she was behaving in a certain way or else like watching her sort of break free of a pattern in some way or make progress towards doing so, those were joyful moments for me as a writer. Mm. Nothing that you would think like, oh, selling the book was joyful or like crafting it. <laughs> those things, it's weird, but like those things aren't as joyful to me as the, as well as the fantasy of those things, I think. <laughs> but also of the like writing the thing, but yeah. Wow, yeah. that, that was such a, I'm just so divided actually as a moderator for this event because I'm just like, I, I feel like both <laughs> oh of these, I want to respond to both of these answers because oh, like, respond. I, yeah. just, I, I felt that, that was so real when you said like, sometimes, especially in Western queer portrayals, just to address the first part about, I guess, portrayals of specifically queer joy, like, I find myself so like, turned off by like, like, not to say that queer joy turns me off. I'm not trying to say that. <laughs> but, but, but just this grandiose, like, oh, and, like, I came out to my parents, and they were loving, and then I, cr right. I cried in their arms, and then they funded a big gay wedding in this big gay <laughs> white town. Like, I feel like there's something so just, like, fatalistically white and Western about that narrative that, like, 
I don't know. As a Palestinian, it's it almost like those ha- that happiness makes me sadder than it does happy in some way. And almost like well, jealousy. I know what you word, mean. But like, yeah. It, I, I, it's so funny because I know. I think I know what you mean. I think it's almost like patronizing in some way, maybe. Right. Like uh, in some, maybe I don't know. It's like oh, because it shouldn't be so joyful. It should be the norm, <laughs> maybe. <Right. laughs> but like, um, it should just it also- be. Yeah. reimagining normal like too mm-hmm. and, and, and how like perhaps i guess like the, those moments that you talk about in the book of like like edging towards mutual understanding like the pairing of um finding one's queerness in a palestinian context slash again as the book begins a queer moment through a na- like a context of palestinian diaspora um mm-hmm. pairing these kind of beautiful moments with um, seeing the parents struggle, seeing again, in, even the character themselves struggle with their internalized homophobia, etc., um, and get a little bit towards more mutual understanding of the self, of the parent dynamic, etc. I think that was more genuine of a queer joy representation for me, at least. Like that's something that's like, oh, it's mm-hmm. like it's feasible within like mm-hmm. the world. Of not just the novel, but in like, you know, the actual oceans largely, yeah, no, oceans I'm, largely. I'm really glad that you said that. Um, and yeah, I mean, exactly. It's, it's, at least it's realistic <laughs> or like, it's, it's, I, I hope that it felt like feasible. And just holding really. accountable who should be accountable, like, um, yeah. which is the system. <laughs> the system right. behind all of this is like the ultimate mode of accountability here. Uh, very le- much on a level of memory, on a level of language, and the minutia of language in this book, I think. Um, yeah. Um, but to also respond mm-hmm. to the second, the process question, um, I because I'm also really curious about this process where, um, mm-hmm. and, and seeing this notion of like the character takes over the, uh, <laughs> uh, and yeah. you were just writing. Did, was it a pretty linear process with writing this novel? As in, like, did you like know where you wanted to begin and just kind of went from there, or uh, were, were were there other versions of the novel that began in different spots totally. or etc. Here, there were so many. There was one that began where it actually ends, now ends. There was one mm. that began with um, entering, or one that really began with, like right away with like addiction um, and like treatment. Um, and there was a version that, that, yeah, so that was one beginning that I had for a while. It was sort of beginning with the addiction component, um, but also, yeah, and then another that began where it ended. Um, and then it, I took so long, of course, to decide like where it begins and ends. And it wasn't a linear process of writing the book. It was like mm. writing a, a lot of it was writing one big chunk of it, which was like, um, and it was like sort of three chunks of the book that were like written linearly at, and then weaving them together, which were the three, the three pieces were the, um, the, hell, the, oh, the, like the love stories that like sort of sure. um, love fantasies and obsessions and then the treatment and like addiction component and then the sort of like family mother daughter um cultural collective component mm. and like putting those together was the struggle and also like where does one begin and that's i think that's why this bethlehem scene became the like opening scene because it sort of ties many things that at least some of at least it catches in that in the net like some of those major overriding themes but like so yeah and and then finally once I like had the structure and like the the arc and the narrative like I still didn't know where it was going to end and I had to step away from it for almost a year actually and then come back to it and I was by then I I knew where it was going to end um so or at least I I yeah I started writing and it turned out I found the ending so wow yeah, that's so. I, and I love that kind of because um, that's almost how I view my poems too. Is like I, the core idea is that like I know what I want to do based on an idea, but then like the actual poem evolves in like the chasing of that idea. And yeah. like I think someone like one one of my like very good friends, um, who's a poet, told me like never write a poem that you know where it's going to end. That mm. very rarely works. Like, works out well because it kind of constrains. I, I think that it was interesting to hear you talk about 
this character that way. It's saying, no, I let the character take over. Um, I like I like that that's true in poetry, that like you shouldn't know where, because of course the writing of the poem is the poem, or like finding the ending is the writing of the poem, essentially. Right. That's so interesting. Um, yeah, and, and, which isn't to say that like you can't do it or whatever, but right. um, but so I, I've like, always I've always found personal joy most in those moments of oh this poem led me to questions even perhaps I didn't even want to answer or or didn't even want to ask myself and questions that I might have been running from. Um, I think that that's again embodied in this book as well with like. No, these are questions that this speaker has to eventually confront and, and has yeah. to work through, uh, no matter how difficult or uncomfortable. Um, right. Oh, it's so, it can be so uncomfortable um, to, for them to work through those things. I really like, yeah, it was emotional to watch for me this process of her. But yeah, I'm sure, I, yeah, we know as writers that it can be emotional. <laughs> Yeah. <gasps> There's another question from the audience. It kind of, again, relates to something we talked about this morning um, mm. about, um, you know, in relating to pink washing and this idea that, like, uh, Palestinians and Arabs are portrayed as, like, innately homophobic and quote unquote backwards compared to, like, uh, the Occident. Um, and um, are there concerns by queer Palestinian artists that their identities or their works will be used against them? in this uh, exception to the Palestinian norm? Um, that's what the question's asking. Um, and how, how, how would it be best to assert queerness without this kind of interference? Um, or, or maybe like another way to rephrase that, like how, how can we like imagine a conception of queerness outside of, of this? Um, outside of what? Of, of the, I guess, normative like gaze of um, uh, that that oh. Palestinians are getting innately homophobic slash the West is like innately, uh, you know. I think that's what I was trying to do was to, was, was which is why her um, the homophobia is not from her culture. It's from her. I mean, like that's why it's internalized. Is like to, that was my way of subverting that. Like I was really afraid to. Okay, on the one hand, I was like didn't want to create perpetuate some stereotype that like arabs are homophobic and you know backwards and like you know all of that when it comes to queerness of course I, you know so at the same time i wanted to actually show what a um like what it would look like to come out to one's palestinian mother or to come out to any mother and in this case the mother mm -hmm. happens to be palestinian and i don't think that like her you know, the mother's, the, the narrator's fear of coming out to her mother and maybe the mother's, like, ideas of queerness are unique to her as a Palestinian or as an Arab, you know, they're right. unique, they're mother, you know, it's, it's, there's so many um, iterations of mother-daughter narrative where there is, like, an element of queerness involved. Um, and, and so I think that those are the two things that I was trying to do was to like get around that, um, you know, that, that stereotype that Arabs are homophobic by locating the homophobia largely within her um, and then, and coming from within and being projected outwards. And then secondly, to also, yeah, to balance that against showing just any mother daughter narrative where, a daughter is like presenting something to the mother that the mother because of her generation you know let alone her cultural background is it's just unfamiliar to you know right. so um so yeah yeah i think i thought a lot about that um while also like trying to imagine some of maybe what she does experience culturally when it comes to being queer and like the fact that like yeah she has cousins that are not so exposed to um, queer people and just have a, an, an idea of it that doesn't necessarily, isn't, you know, um, accepting, <laughs> you know, at least not initially, so. And, and I think that this, again, um, use of an explicitly, a novel that confronts colonial histories um, and inter that those intersections with um, queer phobia, I think, showing that connection and kind of deconstructing. I think that's like almost like a pathway 
to this language of like eventually like these big gay Palestinian wedding etc type like extravagant yeah. uh, narrative. I I think that is, or for me at least, I think that's the way and a path forward at least to to that. I don't think that this book is trying to. I just wanted to clarify with my whole comments. I don't think yeah. the book is trying to be stagnant in its like portrayal of um, queer phobia and like portray it as this big grand unresolvable. Um, mm-hmm. Thing, uh, but but more again to show like no, this is like moving towards hope, but hope is hard and hope yeah. involves hard work, I guess. Um, right. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, it does involve hard work. Yeah, and I also, I mean, like giving. I tried to give her. I wanted her to. I mean, I think part of the reasons that she, to, at times, she can be painful to watch or just like makes bad. She has agency, so I wanted mm-hmm. to really like not show her as like, oh, she's some victim of, you know, her culture that's oppressing her. No, it's right. like she's no victim at all. She can actually be, because of that, like, internalized loathing and shame and homophobia, she can, she can be, um, she can almost, like, create, victimize others at times. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, I was thinking about those tropes that, um, and those sort of, like, stereotypical ideas and representations and trying to subvert them. So this is kind of a huge question because we it, it, like just thinking about wrapping up and stuff. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> but um, the <laughs> this <laughs> this is maybe the best, maybe the worst question to like wrap up on. Uh, but what is next? Someone oh, sure. asks. Um, what, what can we expect next? Uh, what can we look for you in terms of future projects, stories, etc.? Anything you're excited about in the upcoming future? I'm working, yeah, no, I mean, I'm working on another novel, and I'm working on an essay collection, and I think both of them are, you know, about Palestinians in the diaspora, um, and, and um, exploring a lot of, I mean, I, I don't want, actually not really similar themes, um, different themes, um, but I get nervous. I finally learned that I get anxiety when I talk about what I'm working on next. So <laughs> yeah. I, I can't talk about it. Uh, mostly because it's really hard for me to describe things, it seems, other than to like talk about. Um, but yeah, so I'm working on a novel and an essay collection. Um, and it's the essay collection I'm really excited about just because it's fun to do. I love writing essays. And I guess the essay collection, there was an essay. It's that I um, published in The Believer, and it was, it's going to be like the title piece of the collection, and it's nice. called um, Our Arab, and it's sort of, yeah, about a Palestinian in the diaspora in the U.S., and um, uh, maybe exploring certain, like, expectations that one has coming from overseas to the U.S., yeah. and how those expectations are met or not met. <laughs> so, yeah. It's a it's a beautiful essay for folks to check it out. Like I think it's actually available online now. Question mark with the believer. Yeah, it is. Thanks for saying that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> so, um, uh, there is one more question. Do we have time for one more question? Just like lo- logistically, uh, I'm not sure if the Zoom is gonna or the um, event. I know it's funny how that happens, and then you're off. just like alone. In yeah. your room, you know, <laughs> you go from not being alone to being totally alone. <laughs> Uh, we are get yeah, I can ask we, one more. Awesome. We have, okay, we have time for one more question. So the, um, so as an author, do you have anything specific that, I love this question, that you hope queer Palestinians and Arabs take from the book? Alternatively, what do you hope the book does on a larger scale? That's such a, like, beautifully difficult well, question. <laughs> um, yeah, so what do I hope the Palestinians, what was it, what do Palestin, what do... Queer Arabs and Palestinians take right. away from the book? Okay, uh... I think I hope that they feel seen is what I hope, right? And I mean, for me, I think a lot of what brought me to writing the book was a desire to um, just, I think, feel seen in some way um, Mm. because I didn't encounter narratives with queer Palestinian characters or even queer Arab characters. Um, And so I hope that they feel seen and also perhaps feel like humanized too. And like, yeah, not reduced to being either like heroes or victims like Mm. tragic or um, having to uphold some like be some paragon of like, I don't know, virtue or something like that. And, and I maybe hope that it opens the door for them for more narratives um, from queer 
from queer Palestinians and queer Arabs. That's what I hope. Um, and then what do I hope that the book does on a larger level? Um, <laughs> I, could, I hope that it's, you know, I, I guess I hope real honestly. So what, why I started out writing my, when I started writing, I started as a journalist. Um, and my main goal then, and then transitioning into writing fiction was to challenge, uh, stereotypes about like Arabs and Palestinians and mm. you know Muslims as well and because I was I started writing it like after the Iraq war and just like after 9-11 and all these things that were create obviously we all know you know so the stereotypes and I wanted to and I was just editors just you know as a journalist kept saying like basically they wanted the same story of violence stories of violence and like oppression and all these things and so I didn't want to tell that story. I found it really limiting within journalism, even though I still write journalism. But then when I got to fiction, I felt like, okay, I'm just going to create characters that hopefully mm. subvert these stereotypes and challenge them and present mm. an alternate way of how Arabs and Palestinians exist and live, one mm. that's three-dimensional. So I think what I hope that the book does is that it like, yeah, it undercuts those like a really two-dimensional, flat, problematic, just quick go-to ideas that people have um the palestinians and arabs you know are more than what they see in the media so and I are told that. by politicians yeah thank you and that's the whole i think that's like good storytelling does that builds us a new imagination and builds you know um gives us a language that language itself can't give us alone it gives us that extra like uh, muscularity or something um, muscularity. To, to it. Yeah, uh, it doesn't like force itself, I think, too, which people resist. You know, if you're like, oh, that's not how, like, they don't they <laughs> sort of feed it to them subversively, maybe they change their minds. Right, right. <laughs> well, thank you so much. This was really awesome getting to thank talk to you. Thank you so and... much. Thank all of you. And thank you, George. And thank you, um, TPFF. And honestly, this has been, thank you all for being here. This has been so truly nourishing and just thought provoking thank you george for such an amazing conversation retweeting all of that <laughs> just thank you like this was just so um this is so this was great um so and thank you tpff and everyone who came and joined um i think that uh, dania is actually gonna say some um oh, sure. closing words now um but yeah um Oh yeah, there she. Oh wait. Awesome. <laughs> there we go. After the last technical difficulties, I was being overly cautious <laughs> coming in too soon. Oh my gosh. But I want to thank you both from the bottom of our hearts, like for doing this and opening our festival with such a beautiful and heartwarming and vibrant conversation. It, you really set the festival off on a on a great beginning and. You. you know, we'll try to get the comments from the chat to you guys, but there was a lot of love happening on that feed and people really loved um, hearing you both talk about the work. And, you know, it's really important to make sure that, you know, queer voices are part of our narrative and part of the Palestinian voice in its entirety. And in, in truth, you know, the Palestinian, we, we, we didn't have time to get into this, but you know, the queer movement and the Palestinian movement, you know, have worked together very, you know, historically, and we have so much to learn from one, and the other, one another's struggles, and we have worked as allies with one another. So, you know, this is, this is an awesome opportunity to really make sure that Palestinian queer voices by Palestinians and not somebody else, um, yeah. uh, you know, that we were able to showcase that at TPFF is so critical and so important. And, you know, we really look forward to to more of your works, um, you know, from both of you and, you know, wishing you the utmost success, both of you with your works and the book and the tour. And, you know, I know launching on a pandemic is, is not the easiest way uh, to launch a new <laughs> book, but I hope it means that you've been able to travel virtually around the world with it. So yes, I congrats have. to you. Congrats, George, for helping. And thank you, George, for helping us out. Um, thank you. Both are so fun and so amazing. So well. it's been absolutely brilliant and a pleasure and an honor to be able to launch the festival with your voices. So 
Thank you so much. What lovely kind words. And thank you so much for having me and having George. And it's been wonderful. Sorry, I didn't mean to speak on your behalf, George, Amazing. but for having yeah. us. <laughs> yeah. Please. Oh, I just <laughs> yes. wanted to uh, remind our viewers, um, you know, it's the most special way to join this conversation is live. But if your friends and colleagues, um, you know, weren't able to join us, we will, um, we've gotten permission, thank you to George and Zena, to record this session. And we'll be posting it on our TPFF festival page. Um, so you can uh, watch it um, after today for the duration of the festival. Um, and if there's parts you want to rewatch or, you know, or tell people uh, to watch with you, you know, you're, there's definitely plenty of time um, throughout the week to uh, enjoy this conversation. Um, and it is available worldwide. This conversation is not geoblock, so that's amazing. Um, I want to thank our international viewers, people joining us from across the globe uh, who have tuned in to this conversation. Welcome to TPFF, and we are thrilled to have you with us. Um, and thank you for joining us for our very unique and special opening. Um, mm -hmm. I want to remind viewers, um, you know, there's enough time to order your meals from Sahtain at home and then uh, start the uh, Canadian premiere of uh, Between Heaven and Earth by Najwa Najjar, which will be launching at 7 p.m. tonight and will be available for 48 hours uh, viewing. Uh, our shorts collections have launched already, so those will be available for the duration of the festival. And our art exhibit is also has been launched virtual and you can also watch an amazing embroidery exhibition. It's, it's truly incredible um, to see how these, you know, sculptures have been created out of embroidery. Um, so you can check that out in the, at Plum Gallery in person if you are so inclined. Uh, we have COVID safe measures in place to make sure that your viewing is, is a safe viewing, but you can also watch it from the comfort of your home as well. We have created a special recording uh, of the, uh, the exhibition. So yes, please tune in. Uh, tell your friends around the world, your family, friends around the world to join us for this really exciting week of programming that we have lined up for you. It's all available at tpff.ca. Thank you guys.